Because when we gather together, see, uh, the word that came from Rhonda, don't deny the power. The word of the Holy Ghost came. Don't deny the power. That's something to grab onto. Uh, all through the week, you can be repeating that. Will not deny the power. Will not deny the power. Thank you, Lord, for the power of God released in our lives. Uh, that's vital. That's a fresh word from heaven. Amen. Uh, the, the, the ability to be reminded of the word of God that says, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. I mean, we, we look back on the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, and we, we read the encounter that Mary had with the angel. And there in that place, when the angel spoke the will of God and the angel spoke the word of God to Mary, she asked the question, how can this be? How can I have a baby? I, I'm not married. I haven't slept with a man. How, how is that going to happen? And the angel explained, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and overshadow you, and that which will be conceived in you will be the Son of God. So did that really explain a lot to her? We, we look back and we understand it from this side, but just imagine that angel saying that to her. Notice what her response was. Her response was, be it to me according to your word. How much... Can we see, how much more can we see God do in and through our lives if we would read his word and just say what Mary said? Uh, I, I don't understand it with this up here, this gray matter up here, my brain up here. But be it to me according to the word. Amen. Be it to me according to the word. That's releasing your faith. Again, there's no feeling involved in that. I, I, I think... We, we love the feelings and we love to talk, especially in a service like this, the presence of God fills this place and we, you know, you might get goosebumps or you might sense the presence in a stronger way. Well, he's with you tomorrow morning. Did you know that when you get up before your first cup of coffee and you have no feeling at all? <laughs> he's with you the same as he is right now. But we, there might be times we're more sensitive to him and his presence than others, but he's always with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He, nothing with him is impossible. With God, all things are possible. So if we would just agree with his word, say, you know what? I believe it. I choose to believe that. Choose to believe it. Well, yeah, but, no, no, get rid of the yeah buts. <laughs> get rid of, well, what happened to so-and-so, and this is what happened to so -and -so. You know, the longer I live as a Christian and the longer I live as a minister, the more I realize we don't know everything about everybody's heart and where they're at. We, we may not understand what they were going through at the time, or we may not understand their position in faith or not in faith. We, 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 that's not ours to judge, but what our job to do is to say, okay, here's what the Bible says, and and. I choose to believe what the Bible says. I, I studied lately, uh, even more so, Psalm 91. Psalm 91 says, verse 7 says, A thousand can fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Do you believe that? You see, I, I think sometimes people are looking at, yeah, well, so-and-so had that and they died and so-and-so had that and they died and so-and-so didn't make it here and this didn't happen here. And it, where is our vision? What are we looking at? Are, are we looking at where something didn't happen or are we looking at the God who makes all things possible? Do we come back to the scripture that says a thousand can fall here, 10,000 can fall there, but it's not coming here to me. Amen. Amen. Well, that takes strength. I ministered to the men yesterday in, a, in our men's breakfast. What a wonderful time and a wonderful group of men. And, and uh, we, we, we talked about us as men being influencers and how important our, our lives are in our homes. And, and, and I didn't leave enough time to talk about our lives outside of our home, outside in the job place and where, where there's anti-Christ sentiment and anti-God sentiment. How can we live as salt and light, that's what Jesus encouraged us to do. And so, uh, as we talked about that, we talked about the strength that comes from Him. We talked about our position in Him, realizing and relying on Him to work through us. It's, it's not just us up to, oh, okay, I'm going to work this up. I'm going to, 
And that's why believing is so, I think, so misunderstood. I think sometimes we think we have to work something up. And there's no feeling involved. We just simply choose. I choose to believe what you said, Father. There's a rest in that, isn't there? There's a peace that comes in that, isn't there? But if you're, you're looking at this circumstance and failure or this uh, situation and, and you're looking here rather than, but wait a minute, here's what the word says. A thousand can fall here, 10,000 can fall here, but it'll not come near me. Now, that's a simple word, but if we grab a hold of that, we'll see God do some wonderful things. Amen. Praise God. So he's got good things for us. So we're in our 21-day challenge. And as we mentioned at the very beginning of the service, uh, these notes and these scriptures now for this week are on our version. They're on our Facebook page. And they're printed so you can take a copy home with you today after the service uh, and then read along with us the verses that we'll be studying today and this week of God's work in and through his church. The first week was God's work in us. It, it, It starts with us. And I say it starts with us, not us looking in and trying to work something up, a self-help type of thing. I know in the beginning of the year, that's where a lot of focus is. But it's looking inward to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He's our teacher. He's our guide. He's our strength. And if we see something, the first week was God's work in us. And so we read lots of scripture that talked about attitudes and talked about things that were sinful, talked about things that were holy, things that were not holy. And so maybe we saw some areas in our life that we need to make adjustments in. And if so, rely on the Holy Ghost to help us. Because if he's pointing something out, he's doing it because he knows He wants to help us change in that area and become more like Jesus to reflect him accurately in the world that we live in. Amen. To walk with power as sons and daughters of the Most High God. Sometimes Hebrews talks about lay lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily trips us up. Sometimes we allow things to trip us up in our walk and in in, in our testimony and in our lifestyle Uh, reflecting Christ in the world we're not perfect sometimes we make mistakes I understand that but if we'll come back to the place and just say Lord we just look to you we're trusting you thank you you showed me this and I thank you for grace and strength to overcome amen so that was last week Uh, the first week was God's work in us and then last week was God's work through us and how every one of us has is a vital part in the body of Christ there's a, there's a place in learning the, the, the abilities and taking our place and doing something with what God's placed in our lives to help build the kingdom of God. That was last week. Now, this week, we're going to talk about His church. What exactly is the church? God's work in and through the church. Well, the Greek definition for church, the, the word is ekklesia. Maybe you've heard that word before, ecclesia, and it's a compound. It's formed by two different words of calling out and gathering together or meeting. So there is a calling out. So basically, a, a church is the group of people called out meeting together. I know that's kind of a simple definition, but the church also is defined as an assembly. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That's one of our scriptures this week. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Now, you're part of the church whether you're in a local church or not. (laughs) The best is to be part of a local church because that's where people are fed. That was God's plan. God's plan, he put apostles prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in the body of Christ, which is also synonymous with the church, the body of Christ. He put apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in the body of Christ to help equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Say to your neighbor, you've got a job to do. Look at your neighbor. You've got a job to do. 
Amen. Each one of us have a job to do. And God gives us equipping through apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's his plan. So his plan was the gathering together, a calling out of people. So we, we understand we're sanctified, we're set apart for God, we're, we're set apart from the world, set apart to the work of God, to relationship with God first, to the work of God next. Called out, set apart. These are words that the, the scripture uses. Now, we have to be reminded that all of this, and as we said at the beginning, uh, God's work in us, it started with his work in us through what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection, the forgiveness of sin that comes to us, the ability of the Spirit of God to live on the inside to help us live this Christian life. It all starts with Jesus. It can't be just focused upon ourselves. It, it all starts with him. So Ephesians chapter 1, look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Now notice verse 22. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And notice the synonymous terms here. The church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. So it all starts with Jesus. It's not up to us to pick ourselves up and to try to do better. Uh, I think it was Rick Warren said the problem with a lot of the self-help books is we try to look inward, uh, what are my talents, what are my abilities, without God. People that do that without God, it ends up being shallow. But when you have Christ in your life and you realize he gives you gifts, you realize he gives you ability, you realize when you're looking inside, it's looking to the Holy Spirit inside saying, Lord, what did you create me to do? How can I serve you? How can I, the same way that someone brought me to you, told me the gospel, uh, prayed for me when I was lost, or continued to speak the word of God's love and God's forgiveness and God's grace, how can I now be a part of helping someone else come into the kingdom? See, that's the key. It's not just all about us. There is a growth process there is a, the, 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 the uh, what, what, what is it, Peter that said, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So there's a growth process. We do grow, but in the process of growing, we can help others. God, it, it, isn't it great to know God's not expecting you, especially if you just got saved recently or you've been saved a year or two, God's not expecting you or me or any of us, of us to be Christians and walk with him 20, 30, 40 years before we can start helping others. You can start helping others the moment you get saved because you know something. You might not know what you think you should know or compared to somebody who's heard the Bible preached for 20 years, you might not know uh, a, a number of scriptures, but you know you were forgiven. You know you now have new life on the inside where you were heavy and burdened and carrying the sin and the shame and the guilt uh, of your life without Christ, the moment you took a step and chose to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead for your sake and you invited him into your life, you know something happened. What happened? The Bible says you were born again. You were born from on high. The Spirit of God came into you and breathed life into your spirit in relationship to God. You were alive, but you were dead, Romans says. We were alive, physically we're alive, and, and spiritually, I mean, spiritually you're dead. You say, how can I be alive but spiritually dead? The, the spiritual death is separation from God. When we're separated from Him in our sin, but the moment we turn to Him, we're forgiven. We're placed in right relationship with Him. 
So we're brand new. So that might have just happened to you last week, last month, a couple months ago. You know that. That's all you need to know. Say, I don't know everything about God. I don't know everything about Jesus, but I know this. I know that when I put my trust in Him and I ask Him to be the Lord of my life, the guilt and the shame and the heaviness and the, and, and the, the, the weight of all this stuff in the world that, that I did that I knew was wrong or all of a sudden I had a realization of this and that and now I came to Christ and everything is new. That's all you have to say. That's all you have to know. Somebody will see that change in your life. And then, of course, the more we stay in the Word, the more we hear the Bible taught, the more that we uh, submit ourselves to the teaching and preaching of the Word and gathering together in a local body, the more we will grow. Amen. We grow, we develop. That, that, that's His plan. But notice that Christ, all things are under the authority of Christ, and God made Him to be the head over all things for the benefit of the church, and the church is His body. I, I like something in our Bible school this last week, Hayne Schurz was ministering, and, and he said this, he said, people are God's delivery system. We, we want God to download what we need just in our prayer closet. We, we want to be in our prayer, okay, if God's going to, if, if I need help in this area or that area, God's going to just tell me, and if God doesn't tell me, I'm not making any changes. Sometimes, you know, we just, oh, well, I'm going to just hear from God, and God's going to, but did you know that God's delivery system involves people? That's why church is so important. That's why being a part of a local body is so important, because God puts us, you say, well, can't Christians, uh, you know, have relationships with other Christians outside of the church? Yeah, they can, but God's plan and purpose was what we're doing here this morning, having a time of corporate worship. God's plan and purpose is a time where an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher brings the word of God to help equip you. And I know in today's day and age, you know, you can watch all kinds of things on Christian television and listen to, you can watch things online. There's all kinds of availability there, but there's still something about Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, because there's something that happens when we come together as the body. There's impartations in our life through the teaching and preaching of the word from being in the presence of God that you're not going to get by watching it online or on television. Amen. Now, I'm thankful we're online. We're on television. We're out there. But I want to say this to those of you watching. Make sure you get into a local church body. Amen. It's vital. It's vital for your spiritual health and growth, and it's vital for that local church. Because when you're a part of a local church, you're working, you're serving, you're using the gifts and abilities to help others build the kingdom of God. Amen. So we have to see ourselves that way. But I love what Haynes said. People are God's delivery system. We want God to just download what we need in our prayer closet, but God wants to use others to help us grow spiritually. Isn't that good? That's why sometimes when you go to church and, uh, you know, you, you, you lean over to your wife or you say something to the friend that you came with because maybe on the way in you were talking about what we're preaching about this morning. Well, how many of you know, I don't know everything about all of you. I'm glad I don't. <laughs> I don't know everything I need to know about me. But the Holy Ghost knows, and so that's why when we come together and there's preaching and teaching or a word from God, uh, God's speaking individually to our hearts. And that, sometimes people go, how did you know that? Well, I don't know. The Holy Spirit knows. So it all points to Him and His system of, of building one another up. Isn't the book of Proverbs, doesn't it say that iron sharpens iron? Friendships and relationships help us become the men and women that God has created us to become. And so we're all at different places in our walk with Him in different seasons of life, but we can be learning, we can always learn. I mean, I hope that, you know, those of you, those of us that have walked with the Lord, I've been saved over 30 years now, 30-something years, I'm still learning. I hope you're still learning. I hope no matter how old you get, you don't just kind of sit back and say, well, I've heard all that before and I've arrived. Because Paul didn't do that. 
Paul said, I forget the things that are behind. I'm pressing on to more and more with God. And he had incredible experiences with God. And yet he still felt like, I'm learning, I'm growing. We, so it doesn't matter. Until, until you take your last breath, you can be learning. I want to encourage you. Next week, we're going to have a special guest. His name is Doug Jones. Doug is an associate pastor at Rama in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and one of the Bible school instructors there. He was one of our Bible school instructors when we were there back in the 80s. Did he teach you, Kevin, when you were, he was there when you were there too? In the 90s, right? You were there in the 90s. Um, and so he's going to come and minister next week. And I believe I heard him minister uh, a message on valuing and esteeming the Word of God that just, I was like, oh my goodness, that is a powerful word and it would be a great word in season for our church right now at the beginning of this year especially with what we're doing with the 21 day challenge so I encourage you come out next week you're going to be blessed you're going to you're going to receive some nuggets that'll help just propel you into this year propel you when you're hearing the word of God when you're reading the word of God in your quiet time and the spirit of God might speak something simply to you. Isn't it awesome? I love what, what the Spirit of God said to you, Rhonda, about don't deny the power. Go back out there, and I'm going to show you where those keys are. She could have said, eh, Donnie and I have already looked for the last three weeks, four, almost four weeks, however long it was, and just kind of dismissed that prompting of the Holy Ghost. See, it, isn't it amazing? We talk about how to be led by the Holy Spirit, and, and a lot of times it comes just by a thought. It's not like a verbal, thus says the Lord, Rhonda, go find those keys. I, I'm sure you didn't hear an audible voice, right? It wasn't an audible voice, right? But it was a thought that came up on the inside. It was something from her spirit by the Holy Spirit that when she followed that, she found the keys, how, how much are we looking for goosebumps and we're looking for special feelings, but in a time of prayer, we have this simple little thought that comes to us and we just kind of push it off to the side. Oh, well, that's really cool. Wow, God spoke to me today. Well, did you do something with it? Because <laughs> if you do something with it, he'll add to it. But if you just ignore it, you're not going to get anything more until you do what he told you to do last. Amen. Wow. Okay, so people are God's delivery system. So the church is a called out group we're, we're, we're Christians we're we're to reflect Christ and I know sometimes we don't do it right sometimes and I'm not making excuses but I know sometimes we get in the flesh and sometimes we we may not do it right but you know what we we pick ourselves up and we say Lord forgive us we want to move on we want to go forward we want to help people that's what you've called us to do so inside the church I see two things the work of God in us, so in us as a church. What did Jesus say in John chapter 13, verse 34? He said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you, your, so you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Isn't it amazing how quickly the world picks up on strife and when Christians fight and are against each other. My wife and I were privileged a few years ago to go to Israel because we'd never been to Israel, and so we went for her 50th birthday. So I won't tell you how many years ago that was because she still looks like she's only 35. So uh, we went for her 50th birthday. We got to go to Israel, and, and there's, there's a couple of places there, and those of you that have been, you realize that in Jerusalem there's a couple places where they believe the tomb was, and so... Uh, where, where the most popular, so, so the Pentecostals believe that the tomb of Christ is outside of the gates and somewhere a little bit separate, and it's kind of like a garden, and you've seen, maybe you've seen pictures of the garden, but uh, traditionally, the Catholics and the Armenian Christians and the Orthodox, they all have like this building that has like different wings, so the Catholic is here, and the Armenian is here, and the Orthodox is here, and it's like uh, this big cover over this place where they believe the tomb uh, of Christ is or was, and, and so they share this space, but often they get into fights when they're sweeping the floor 
because you got dirt on my side and this is your side. I mean, and I'm like, are you kidding me? We're, we're supposed to be reflecting Christ and his love and we're fighting over some of these silly types of things. Well, the scripture says, Jesus said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Now, love doesn't mean no correction. Please understand that. Love doesn't mean that sometimes people don't hold us accountable. I think that's the, sometimes the world's picture of love is, well, every, if you love me, I can just do anything I want. No, I'm going to tell you the truth. Yeah, you can choose to do certain things, but I'm going to tell you the truth. The scripture says what? Speak the word in, uh, speak the truth in love. Speak the word, speak the truth with love. I love you, and I'm going to tell you the truth. Whether you like it or not, you do something with it. So uh, love doesn't mean no accountability. Love doesn't mean, well, we just do whatever we want, and if you tell me something otherwise, you, must, you don't love me because you won't let me do what I want to do. Well, if what you want to do is against the word and the will of God and the plan and purpose of God, we're going to tell you because we love you. And you can deny it right now, but we've known people that have said, I don't want to hear that, or I know I'm doing right. And then later they turn and they realize, oh, I'm so thankful that you challenged me. I'm so thankful that you gave me the truth. So love has to be prevalent inside the church. Unity. John chapter 17, Jesus said, I've given them the glory. Verse 22, I've given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are, I in them and you in me, may they experience such perfect unity, look at, that the world may know, that the world may know. So it starts on the inside, us having love for one another, us being in unity. We may not always agree on all the things that happen in the, in the local church, but there has to be a unity. There has to be, a, okay, this is the direction we're going, and this is what we're going to do. This is how it's going to be. That's unity. That's submission. Uh, you know, sometimes people talk about submission and authority. Submission begins when you disagree. Amen. Submission be oh, it's easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been in the church for X amount of years. Yeah, I agree with this. I agree with that because everything that happens you agree with. But the moment something goes a little bit different. Now, I'm not talking about illegal, immoral, unethical, unscriptural. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about maybe a different vision, a different direction, a different uh, thought that you thought. And you go, no, I, I, I don't like that. That's when submiss submission starts. That's when we say, okay, this is where we're going. This is what we're doing. That's unity in the church. So the world, Jesus said it, the world may know when we're in unity, that, we'll, that Jesus has been sent. Others will see it because of the way we function. Then we can function like a body. I'm not going to take the time to read the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, beginning with verse 12, says the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body, so it is with the body of Christ. So we're talking about the church, God's work in us as a church and through us as a body through us as the church. So, it, again, synonymous, body of Christ, church. We are the body of Christ. And just as our human physical body has many parts and to it inside and outside, so the body of Christ is the, is the picture that we have. And in Ephesians chapter 4 talks about the body of Christ, every part having a supply to help the body to grow. So there again, looking at what God has placed in you and me as individuals, his sons, his daughters, the supply that we bring to help the body of Christ to grow. That's vital. That's important. So our bodies have many parts. Every part is necessary. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. Now, outside the church, so he works in us first in here, in, in this place, we walk in love for one another. It's interesting, you know, in families, 
you have to choose to love, right? Because your family, you can't choose your mom and dad, you can't choose your brothers and sisters, but you can choose how to love, you can choose how to respect, you can choose how to honor. Well, it's similar in the body of Christ, but because the, the church is the way it is in, in the world, if I get mad here, I can go somewhere else, right? I don't have to work things out because I can just go somewhere else. I don't like that. I don't like them. They were mean to me. I'm going to go to another church. You know, I, I was after I listened to this message by Doug Jones um, on, on esteeming the word, words to value, I, I wasn't even thinking about anyone in particular. I wasn't thinking about any circumstance, any situation. I, I was just in my prayer time. And this thought came to my heart, and I wrote it down. When a person is offended and leaves a church... The enemy knows that all he has to do is bring up that same situation or same opportunity for offense wherever they go, and they'll be offended again, and they'll leave that church. I mean, you see it all the time. You see people go from church. Now, I, I, I realize, I understand, sometimes people do. There's a change. It's a God-ordained change. But many times, probably more times than not, it's out of offense. More times than not, it's because they didn't get picked for something or somebody said something to them that rubbed them the wrong way or somebody wasn't kind to them. And I'm not making, I'm not making excuses. We have to do everything we can to walk in love and respect and honor and help people, right? That, that, that's first and foremost. But sometimes, and sometimes it's that person, they take it the wrong way. The person saying it didn't mean that at all, and the way it came across maybe was that way, and then they were offended. But that thought came to me. When a person is offended and leaves a church, the enemy knows that all he has to do is bring up the same opportunity wherever they go, and they'll get offended again, and they'll leave that church. And your growth, my growth, is tied to being in a local church. Amen. And I'm preaching to the choir because you're here. You braved the storm and you made it here. So I'm not, I'm not saying this with anybody in mind. Please understand that. But notice that there's a work that happens in us and then there's a work that happens through us. Outside the church, Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 12, he said, I tell you the truth Anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done and even greater works than these because I'm going to be with the Father. So you say, okay, what's the job of the church? Well, the job of the church, we're part of the body. We should do our part to help the body of Christ to grow. Ephesians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're, we're individual. And the scripture says, we read it earlier in our 21-day challenge, that God places in the church. So there's, they're in the body. So each one of us are placed in specific places, maybe with certain things. And you say, well, how do I know? Well, what bothers you the most? When, when you walk into a church or you walk into here, or you say, wow, you really need help with this. Somebody should do something about. Well, if you have a thought that says somebody should do something about, that somebody is more than likely you. Amen. You can say, well, how, how does that work? Well, you noticed something. You noticed something that needed some help, and you obviously you noticed it because there's something in you that can help fix it. Amen. So instead of just going, oh, they don't know how to do that, or they should really do a better job with that, or they really need to, I know, I'm going to go tell the pastor this is what he needs to do. So you tell the pastor this is what you need to do. No, and, and a lot of times us as pastors as we hear that we say you know what that's a great idea when can you start i think sometimes then that hinders doesn't it guys sometimes then they don't want to come and tell us their idea because they know we're going to say that's a great you saw that that's a great idea you can do that that's something you can do so inside the church he works outside we can do the works of jesus what did jesus do 
went about, he, Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. The works of Jesus are preaching and teaching the gospel. The works of Jesus are laying hands on the sick and seeing them healed. The works of Jesus are proclaiming, telling others about Jesus. The works of Jesus are taking care of widows and orphans. In the, in the men's group yesterday, Alan was sharing some of the vision in the heart of, of the guys and, and talking about what can we do uh, reaching out to touch widows in our church and orphans and how, how can we support. So here's one of the things we're doing is we're helping with this orphanage. But how about here in America? Where about in, in our church, widows in our church that may need some help? There's some guys that are volunteering to help widows and get some support and get some help out there, right? The scripture says the church can care for widows who are truly alone. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 16. If a woman who is a believer has relatives who are widows, she must take care of them and not put the responsibility on the church. Then the church can care for the widows who are truly alone. James chapter 1, verse 27. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. That's pretty good, isn't it? So what are the works? So the works are the church bringing Christ outside of these four walls into the world that we live in. So many of you rub shoulders every single day with people who don't know Jesus, but they see Jesus in you. And let me just encourage you, don't give up, don't lose hope, don't be discouraged in your Christian walk. I, I was sharing, Hain was sharing with the Bible school students uh, a couple of testimonies from pastors that he knows that their salvation experience, the person who told them about Jesus, the person who, who, who was instrumental or that last boom, key in their life, they probably never knew it and won't know it until they get to heaven. But he was sharing about a pastor uh, back in the 60s who was strung out on drugs. He was long hair, hippie, lived in the projects of this certain area. And um, this church was going out door to door, passing out tracts and talking about Jesus to the people in the neighborhood. And, and this little 10-year-old boy, so this guy, no shirt on, strung out on drugs, long hair, Here's a knock at his door. He goes to the door and he opens the door and there's this little 10-year-old kid with a track for spiritual laws. And he, the way he described it was this little 10-year-old kid is like, hi, mister, I, I'm just here to tell you that Jesus loves you and God has a good plan for your life and he gives him the track and the guy takes it and goes, you know, kind of growls at him and slams the door and the kid walked away. He said that kid did not know that as soon as he closed the door, that, that guy turned, fell on his knees, and called on God to save him. So that 10-year-old kid went home, and he probably thought, boy, that was a failure. Little does he know when he gets to heaven that that guy turned out to be a pastor and is ministering to thousands of people today because one little 10-year-old kid gave a guy a track, and the 10-year-old kid probably felt like a failure, but you never know what one little step of obedience will do in a person's life. Sometimes I believe God lets us see that. He lets us hear a testimony. I, I have to tell this story. I'm going to tell it. Uh, I know Lucy's going to share this, Lucy, Jim and Lucy Mitten. Uh, I, was talking, I was talking to them a couple weeks ago about their ministry and the things that they're doing. You saw pictures if you were here last week of the, they take their camper and they're part of a group that goes to different places in America to build a mission or reservations where the Indians are, place, ministries that have needs of construction and painting and all those kinds of things. And uh, so we were talking and, and Lucy years ago was part of Life Choices Pregnancy Center. I think she held a Bible study for these single moms and lost touch with, with all the ladies that were part of that group. And she was at a, I believe it was a funeral service. Is that what it was, Jim? A funeral service? She was at a funeral service, and the pastor who was there looked at Lucy and said, I know you. Now, this was back, I think she did that in the 80s. 
she do that back in the 80s i think and so this is from the 80s this pastor looks at lucy and she says to lucy she says i know you and Lucy looked at her, and she looked fairly familiar, and they got to talking. This lady said, you were teaching a single mom's Bible study when I was unmarried and had a child, and now she's a pastor of a church. You never know. So the work of God in us as a church, love and unity and functioning as a body, but then also outside these four walls, what kinds of things can we do to help minister to people and bring God's life, God's love, the works of Jesus to them. So as a church, I just want to challenge us to, to look up and see the harvest, as Jesus said in John chapter 4. The fields are already white. I know they're white today because of snow, but the fields are already white unto harvest. They're ready. People are wanting to hear a good word. People are wanting to hear good news. People need peace in their lives. People are so concerned about North Korea, Korea bombing America and bombing Hawaii and bombing nuclear and, and this country and that country and all the stuff that's happening. People are, are fearful. But you don't have to live in fear. You can live in peace in the midst of whatever's going on in the world because of Jesus Christ. That's our job. Let's all stand up together. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you so much for this time that we've had together. Thank you that you're coming back again. Is not the, the signs of your coming back are not earthquakes and famines and wars. Uh, the scripture says those things all lead up to the sign. The sign of your return is when the gospel is preached to every Nathan, nation, every ethnic, Nos group, every group of people. And Lord, according to the studies that I've read, there's over 6,000, almost 7,000 unreached people groups. People that still need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in our own community, in our own nation, and the nations of the world. So Lord, help us to see our part in the church. Help us to walk in love, help us to be in unity, and help us to reflect you outside the four walls of this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right.